Hi, everybody, and welcome to Unbound, the Bay Area Book Festival's virtual conversations. Today's conversation is about courts, COVID-19, and voter suppression. I'm Lala Wu, co-founder of Sister District, a national organization that drives grassroots support to progressive state legislative candidates in key states. Joining me today is a wonderful panel. We've got Rick Hassan, author of Election Meltdown and the often cited Election Law blog, Alan Hirsch, author of A Short Story History, of presidential election crises, and Abdi Sultani, executive director of the ACLU of Northern California. So to frame our discussion, I want to start with the Voting Rights Act, which was a monumental civil rights achievement. But unfortunately, in 2013, the Supreme Court invalidated the requirement that certain states with a history of oppression remain subject to scrutiny by the Department of Justice. This significantly weakened the Voting Rights Act, and after Shelby, states like Alabama, Mississippi, North Carolina, and Texas were freed of DOJ oversight and quickly enacted laws that disenfranchised voters, from voter ID laws to cutbacks to early voting. Since then, courts have managed to hold back some, but not all, of these harmful policies. Dedicated activists have fought for reform, and now coronavirus has swept the globe and has introduced new logistical and safety challenges to voting, while also sparking new momentum for electorate expanding reforms such as vote by mail. There's a lot to talk about today, but what we're going to cover is really what to look for as we approach November's election. We're going to talk a little bit about what's happening at the state and the federal levels, both in terms of policy as well as the court's responses. And also one of my favorite topics, why what's happening at the state level is so critically important. And we're also going to talk about what you can do to help. So without further ado, why don't we jump right in? Um, we're going to start in a bit of a dark place, but I think it's important for, um, you know, responding to the moment here. And uh, the question is, what is your nightmare scenario for November 2020? Alan, why don't we start with you? Well, it's hard to pick just one, but if I had to pick just one, it would be the president postponing the election or trying to, uh, and then getting cooperation from some Republican governors, um, because the virus gives him an excuse to do that. And if he felt he was going to lose the election, it's easy to imagine him seizing on that excuse. That's very wise and very terrifying. <laughs> so thanks for that insight. And Rick, how about you? Well, uh, I'm less concerned about postponing the election because uh, the Constitution gives Congress the power to set the date of the election. And uh, that was done in 1845. It's the first Tuesday uh, after the first Monday in November. And in any case, the 20th Amendment of the Constitution uh, says that uh, if there's no choice of president by January 20th, then we go to the rules of succession. Uh, but I am concerned, uh, given the kinds of rhetoric, for example, that we've heard President Trump say about voter fraud and uh, 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 joking uh, I think by my last count, at least 28 times about staying in office beyond his constitutionally mandated term, I am concerned about things that could happen. And let me mention uh, two of them, um, both related to um, uh, Detroit and Philadelphia, two uh, largely Democratic African-American cities in swing states. Uh, so one thing we know is that because of the coronavirus, there's going to be a flood of absentee ballots, uh, both Michigan and Pennsylvania have um, enacted laws, this is before coronavirus, but recently for just for this uh, new election cycle, that lets anyone who wants to vote by absentee uh, do that without an excuse. Okay, so uh, we're going to get a flood of absentee ballots. Uh, so here's uh, kind of scenario number one is uh, uh, it takes a really long time because Detroit and Philadelphia have pretty bad histories of counting votes and being efficient. It takes a really long time to count votes. And so on election night, uh, Trump is ahead in one or both of those states. And it's going to take five days for uh, the votes to be counted. And after five days, Joe Biden is declared the winner of the election. And in those five days, Trump claims, as he has uh, over the last few months, that uh, vote by mail ballots are fraudulent. Uh, and he claims victory. And we end up having a fight over uh, who the... Um, winner of the election is, and people do not 
uh, people are divided on who the winner is. Um, and that brings in my second nightmare scenario, which is both uh, Pennsylvania and uh, Michigan have Republican dominated legislatures. Uh, they might try either before the votes are fully counted or even before the election is held to say, we've got such a problem with uh, the virus that we're going to not hold a presidential election at all in those states. And we're going to use our powers under Article 2 of the Constitution to appoint electors directly, uh, which is something the United States Supreme Court in a, in a case 20 years ago called Bush versus Gore said that, um, that uh, state legislature can take back that power. So this is uh, kind of an alternative nightmare scenario where voters are literally disenfranchised and able to, uh, in being able to vote for the president because the legislature takes this power back that, uh, that no one else would think. And I think uh, that no one thinks would be a reasonable thing to do, but it might be constitutional. And this, I think, would trigger uh, huge societal unrest, uh, this kind of ultimate kind of voter suppression. So both of these things are scenarios that are literally keeping me up at night. And I should say, uh, last point, and then I'll stop hogging the camera, is that uh, I worked with a group of uh, 25 scholars and, and thinkers on how can we avoid this kind of meltdown in November. And we just recently issued a report called Fair Elections in a Crisis. So if you Google Fair Elections in a Crisis, uh, you'll be able to find it. 14 recommendations for how to minimize the risk, including the risks that I've described. Could I just jump in very quickly? I, I share all those concerns. And in fact, my choice number two would have been some variation on the president not respecting the outcome. Uh, but I do want to say, uh, uh, Rick, when you say that the 20th Amendment and by statute, Congress declares the date, and so you're not, um, you're not concerned about the president postponing the election, uh, the notion that he would respect constitutional processes as becomes clear when you spin out your own scenario, is optimistic. Yeah, I, I suppose it depends on the question of, uh, you know, what would it mean if he said, oh, we're not voting on November 3rd? Uh, he doesn't have any power to actually, uh, you know, to, to declare the polling places closed. I mean, unless he tried to use martial law, and then we're in a whole, a whole other world. Um, no, my concern is that, my concern is he wouldn't have to, that red state governors would say, okay, if, if the president says that, I'm going to obey my president as I have all along. Yeah, well, so yeah, that, that would be a, a, another nightmare to add to the list. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for those insights. Um, Abdi, why don't we uh, start to take this conversation in a more positive direction and talk a little bit about um, what's being done to prevent this nightmare, these nightmare scenarios, um, and what's being done to expand uh, voter rights generally. Well, with what Alan and Rick just said, I had been sleeping pretty well, and uh, maybe not so much going forward. Uh, but there's a lot to pay attention to, and what Rick and Alan described would be either people not following and respecting the decision of voters or changing the rules very late in the game such that they would, you know, go around the voters to the legislature. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I have my pocket constitution with me at all times and I have opened it up to the 20th amendment, which I have not spent much time reading. So thanks for the tip. But I think in terms of what is it that we can do and what is it that we are doing, uh, the ACLU and many of our partners among both legal organizations and grassroots organizations are working hard right now to ensure that every eligible citizen in the United States of America has the opportunity to vote in this election. So that comes down to the fact that if we were to proceed with this election under the rules of many states, thousands and thousands, if not actually millions of voters would not have the opportunity to safely cast a ballot in the context of COVID. So there's a number of strategies and solutions that are underway. Some of them have required passing new legislation in states in order to adjust their voting rules to expand access. Some of it's involved going to court and asking uh, the judicial branch under state courts or federal courts to interpret and enforce the law in such a way that it creates access. And then ultimately, uh, voting is our constitutional right as citizens, and we're the ones who will exercise it 
and we're the ones who need to speak up for it uh, to be fully fully protected. You know, I think Lala, I've given a pretty broad response because I think today we have time to dig in and go deeper. Uh, but I think the key here is to either create new laws that expand access and update elections to work in the context of COVID or go to court to interpret the rules correctly so that people can cast their vote rather than what Rick described, which is to change the rules midstream in order to uh, further restrict or suppress the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a really helpful framing and way to um, kick off the kind of policy part of our conversation. Um, before we dive in there, I just want to spend a couple minutes um, talking about what's at stake. You know, I've, I'm a former lawyer myself, and I think that everybody here takes all of these things very seriously and loves getting into the weeds. Um, but there is uh, uh, I don't want us to forget what, why this matters, you know, what's at stake here um, and whose lives are affected. Um, so, Abdi, why don't we start with you again, actually, and, to, to, and then open up to everybody. Just talk a little bit about um, what we're really fighting for and why this matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, fundamentally, you know, we live in a democracy and the American Revolution was on the principle that government derives its power from the consent of the governed and the consent of the governed is expressed through elections. So this is fundamental. Uh, this is pretty core to who we are. And so then the question becomes like who gets that vote and on what basis um, can people participate in the election and based on what criteria are people excluded from elections. Uh, Rick talked about the 20th amendment. Um, I'm a huge fan of the big voting rights amendments, the 15th Amendment, which barred discrimination in voting based on race or previous condition of servitude. The 19th Amendment, which barred discrimination based on sex with regard to the right to vote, and then later amendments that expanded the vote to every citizen under the age of, up over the age of 18. Each of these is a marker of race or sex or the poll tax or age that through the constitutional amendments, we mark time. We mark time through the amendments by which we've expanded the electorate. We mark time through the legislation that follows these constitutional amendments by which we expand the electorate. When we expand the electorate, we include in it people who are not the homeowner who has regular delivery of mail, who's highly educated and has resources and all of that. Those folks, it's important that we vote, uh, but also that they're gonna vote. The people who are excluded often are poor people based on the condition of poverty that manifests itself in things like if you're a renter and you frequently have to move or you have unstable housing or if you're unhoused, making sure that those people have the opportunity to register, get reliable voter information, and can vote. It's the non-English learner, a non-English speaker, who is the citizen who has a right to vote, but who needs the opportunity to get the information in the language that they speak. It's the formerly incarcerated, or even currently incarcerated, depending on state law, to ensure that those folks have the opportunity to vote. But I will say race is still at the heart of this issue. And in some of the cases that the ACLU has brought, even after Shelby, we have found uh, courts willing to rule that the, the suppression law in, in some states has been written with the express purpose and design uh, of suppressing the votes of African-Americans or other people of color. So that's who we're talking about. We're talking about every one of our right to vote. And we're also talking about the rights of uh, voting for people who are really at the margin of political power and whose vote counts so much for that purpose. Thanks, Alan or Rick. Do you have anything to add to that? I think it was really, really well said. I, I would say uh, it's absolute amen to all of that. And it's been crucial, a crucial part of the American story, the expansion of the franchise. But I'd like to see maybe the next amendment being to abolish the Electoral College. So not only do we get more and more people voting, but we have everyone's vote counting the same. And of course, we can get into that more. 
But something I talk about in my book that bothers me a lot is the Electoral College, it, the problem isn't simply that it values people's vote differently, but it is an invitation to fraud, to hackers, to crises. And if I was given a third nightmare scenario, it would be one that actually Rick talked about in his series of scenarios, which is we wake up the day after the election and we don't know who won. And that, of course, is, a, is something that has happened as recently as 2000. Um, but the Electoral College increases the odds of that exponentially. It produces squeaker elections routinely in a way that the national popular vote uh, doesn't. I, I won't get in the weeds on that un unless anyone, <laughs> anyone wants me to, but I do think it would be fruitful for us to look at that as the next constitutional amendment. And short of that, there is a movement, even as we speak, the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, which is seeking to get rid of the Electoral College without a constitutional amendment by having enough states agree that they will honor they will cast their electors for whichever candidate wins the national popular vote. And if you get enough states joining that agreement, totaling 270 or more electoral votes, we will ensure that the winner of the national popular vote becomes president. And right now there are 100 states totaling 196 electoral votes um, who have agreed to that. I, I love this notion, Abdi, you were saying of marking time in terms of our amendments. And yes, I mean, if we could see a new amendment um, that uh, 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 abolishes the Electoral College in our lifetimes, it would be it would be pretty incredible, along with all of the um, electorate expansion that still needs to be done. Um, you know, one thing that occurs to me is that there are so many different ways to suppress the vote, to make one person's vote um, count less. And Electoral College is one of them. Gerrymandering is another. Um, uh, all these forms of voter suppression keep people from exercising this constitutional right. You know, last year in um, the House passed HR 1, which would have addressed a lot of these issues, including limiting partisan gerrymandering, restricting money in campaigns and expanding voting rights. Um, but of course, it was a non-starter in the Senate. So although it had a lot of great stuff in it, um, that's not something that um, it looks to me like is going to get passed anytime soon. Um, Rick, I'd love to hear from you about what you think we can expect from policy at the federal level in terms of voting rights and uh, other issues related to people exercising this constitutional um, ability and uh, what we might be able to see at the state level as well. All right. And so uh, I think looking at the states and looking at the courts is going to be more fruitful than looking at the federal government. And, and let me just back up for a second to uh, uh, Abdi's point about um, these amendments and how you know, we started off with white male property holders being the only ones who could vote and things have gradually expanded. And we see that as a story of progress. And it is a story of progress, but it, it, to the modern way of thinking about elections, it's backwards. We shouldn't be saying, um, you can't discriminate in voting on the basis of this or that or this other thing. We should be saying you have an affirmative right to vote. And, you know, really, um, as much as I'm not a fan of the Electoral College, uh, I've come around to believe that uh, what we really need is a fundamental uh, constitutional amendment that would guarantee people the right to vote if they are uh, eligible uh, to vote. Uh, you know, we have to define what that is. But an affirmative right to vote. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at the outset, there's no right to vote for president. Uh, and of course, until the 17th Amendment, there was no right to vote for the Senate. Uh, so the Constitution is very thin. And what we have now is a kind of state by state slog where groups like the ACLU have to go in and they say, all right, there's a pandemic going on. And we've got um, uh, lots of people, uh, maybe millions of people who are not going to be able to go to polling places in November. So what we need is to be able to have people vote by mail if they can't vote in person. Well, in about two thirds of the states, there's no excuse to vote by mail. But in a third of the states, you need to have an excuse. And so now you have uh, the ACLU and other groups having to go state by state. And so let's take Texas, for example. Uh, the Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, is taking the position that fear of contracting the coronavirus is not a legitimate excuse to be able to 
uh, cast an absentee ballot. And so there has to be litigation over this. Already a trial court has said he's wrong. You can read the statute in a way to, uh, so that the excuse includes that. And I think that's the right way to read the statute. I wrote an article a number of years ago called The Democracy Canon, which was in the Stanford Law Review, which traced back to the 1800s uh, a rule of thumb that courts have used, which says that in the case of an ambiguous statute, read it to favor enfranchising voters. I mean, that's what we need. Um, but so we have this really decentralized system. We're conducting elections in 10,000 election jurisdictions in November. And we're doing this uh, where different states have different rules, where it's become polarized, where you have the president claiming there's fraud. And so following behind him, you have a number of Republicans trying to make it harder for some people to vote by mail, when that may be the only safe way to vote uh, in these places. And uh, at the federal level, not only do you not get HR1, this massive bill passing uh, that uh, passed the Democratic House and didn't even get a hearing in the Senate, uh, you can't even get agreement to adequately fund states that wish to expand vote by mail. So right now in, in the first phase of the coronavirus uh, federal legislation, $400 million was provided. Uh, for states to ramp up. It's very expensive to run vote by mail if you've never done it before, especially in a short time frame. But the best estimates that I've seen place the amount that's needed at $1.5 to $2 billion. And uh, uh, you know, President Trump made this comment that if, if what the Democrats wanted uh, had been put into the coronavirus bill, no Republicans would ever be elected again. Uh, which is demonstrably untrue. Republicans do quite well under vote by mail in lots of places, including Utah, which has all uh, mail elections. But it's pretty clear, especially in the short term, if we're thinking about dealing with voting rights in the time of the virus, that we cannot look to the federal government to lead. Instead, it's going to be a state by state fight, and it's going to require, not everywhere, there are some states that I think are being quite sensible, including some states run by Republicans. And I'd point to Ohio, where I think they've been doing a pretty good job in trying to uh, work on rules that will allow people to vote by mail in November. But in a number of states, it's going to be this fight where it's ultimately going to come down to courts, which are themselves polarized. And it's just such a backwards way to think about this. I would point us to South Korea, where they recently held an election. Uh, there's a national election uh, board, and they were able to set rules, and everyone was able to vote safely, uh, both in person uh, and otherwise. And it, uh, uh, it's the way that the American democracy should work. So I think we shouldn't just imagine incremental steps towards a greater voting rights. We actually need much more radical changes to our constitution in order to ensure that all eligible voters are able to cast a meaningful ballot that will be fairly and accurately counted. I just want to underline how important it is to thank you for that, Rick. I just want to underline the importance of the states here. Um, and states have always been the laboratories of democracy. And they're just extra, extra important at this time when, as you say, we're not going to see leadership at the federal level. Um, and I also agree, you know, we're going to need some kind of massive, much more visionary change than what we've been thinking about now to get us to where we need to be um, to get us to this place where um, the vote, right to vote is as uh, protected as it should be. But in the meantime, you know, we're really going to have to focus on what's happening in the states and um, encouraging and doing everything we can to ensure that they are uh, putting into place good, sound reforms. Um, especially during this time. So you touched on this a little bit, Rick, but maybe um, we as a group could speak a little bit more about how COVID-19 has shaped the um, conversation since it swept across the globe um, and how it's changed the kind of policymaking opportunities. It seems that there's been a lot more talk of, for example, vote by mail. So um, Alan, why don't we start with you there? So, a number of things. We have the recent experience in Wisconsin, and voters were given the choice between not voting, giving up what is, should be a sacred constitutional right, and certainly is a major responsibility of citizenship, or risking their health and life. And in fact, a number of people lost their lives in exercising the franchise. That's outrageous. Um, Clearly, one of the major things we should be doing between now and November is in all 50 states encouraging a robust vote by mail apparatus. So I completely agree uh, about that. Um, and also, as Rick mentioned, there is this widespread notion among Republicans, it's almost become an article of faith that they will be hurt 
by voting by mail. There's absolutely no evidence to support that at all. But even if it were true, the idea that we should deny people the right to vote or suppress votes because it will hurt our political party is completely unacceptable. Could not agree more. <laughs> um, so what are some of the ways, the, um, uh, let me start over on that. So as we look at Wisconsin, for example, I think that's a really great and interesting recent example. What, what does that tell us about what we can um, expect for November, if anything? Um, and what does it tell us about the way that uh, courts may respond um, and intervene in these kinds of crises? Um, Rick, why don't we start with you? So I'm hoping that Wisconsin is an outlier. Uh, in, in the Wisconsin case, uh, you know, the question was about um, either delaying the election, uh, which the Democratic governor sat on for weeks, I think, very irresponsibly. Um, and uh, then at the last minute, because he knew he faced complete um, uh, opposition from the Republican legislature, tried to uh, move that election. And it went to the state Supreme Court, which divided essentially on party lines. They don't, they're not really partisan judges, but they're, you know, they're closely aligned with the Democratic or Republican parties. And then on the question of allowing ballots to be accepted slightly later uh, than uh, election day, uh, on that question, it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And there, too, the court divided along partisan and ideological grounds. Uh, if that's what November looks like, it's very bad, because I think, you know, if, if it comes down to a dispute, Trump versus Biden at the U.S. Supreme Court, and all the Republican appointed justices vote one way and all the Democratic justices appoint another, um, it's bad for both legitimacy of our election system and the legitimacy of the courts. Fortunately, it's not much of what I'm seeing so far in other court decisions. Uh, I don't want to say I'm optimistic, but I would say that I'm at least hopeful that judges of both, from both conservative and liberal backgrounds understand that we're in extraordinary times. This was something that was not acknowledged by the Supreme Court majority opinion in the Wisconsin case, and that was very troubling. I think that was more troubling than the result, which I think was, uh, while incorrect, was defensible. The idea that you, you don't change a deadline, a deadline is a deadline for an election. But to not even recognize the difference. And yet, in lots of other cases, in cases around the country, where it's, whether it's the question of whether we should expand excuses to include fear of getting the virus, or whether it's, uh, should we change the uh, way that people can collect petitions if they're independent candidates who want to get on the ballot? Uh, or it's about uh, um, whether or not uh, to take a case uh, that just came out of Oklahoma, whether or not if you want to file an absentee ballot, you need a notary. Uh, imagine trying to find a notary right now while everything is closed. What we're seeing are courts uh, across the spectrum recognizing that the balancing that's necessary in these cases is going to be struck differently uh, because of the pandemic. And so, so I think that's a hopeful sign. If things look like Wisconsin, we're in big trouble. But there are some reasons to be hopeful that they're not all going to look like Wisconsin. And, and I think uh, uh, Abdi can speak to that probably uh, better than I can in terms of uh, what the ACLU is seeing around the country. You know, the fascinating thing about United States of America is right there in the name, United States of America. So it's it's a federated government of states as well as the federal government. And then even within states, you have local election districts, depending on the state in California, it's our counties. So there is this fractured election system. And like every other part of American government, power is broken up into pieces. So there's not one president who could single-handedly uh, shift the rules in one extreme direction or another extreme direction. And so you're going to have that complexity of state laws, local elections, and then you do have congressional standards and constitutional standards that apply um, most often federally to the federal elections. And often extend to local elections too. So it's it's a complicated landscape. And I think at the end of the day, where, where COVID comes into this is epic because the fact that you have to show up at a polling place is something we fought for and is really integral, especially to how, how a lot of 
low-income voters and communities of color have um, built the practice of voting. It's the act of going to the local neighborhood polling place. Uh, polling places are often the place where voter suppression happens uh, through long lines, long waits. For We've seen this in election after election, people having to wait hours, uh, low-income and low-wage workers who have to deal with childcare and all kinds of issues. So if we let this um, kind of go, like that's not going to work very well to have the elections running as if there's not a public health emergency when we have to have social distancing and cleaning and protect the health of both the voter and the poll worker. But eliminating in-person voting is not the solution because not every person has the stability of housing to register to vote at an address, receive their absentee ballot at that same address, cast their ballot from that place. There has to be in-person election day voting as well as some early voting that would spread those in-person voters out. In California, just um, last year, we were able to pass a very important bill for election day voter registration. That reaches the person who's not even been registered or who has moved, and they're guaranteed the ability to register to vote and vote on election day. So for all those reasons, we have to have some amount of adequate in-person voting and early voting, including in states with election day registration. But parallel to that, there has to be universal access to the absentee ballot for every voter without excuse. And whether that's done through the laws that states already have, or as Rick talked about, by interpreting the existing statutes generously on the side of the voter, making sure every person has that opportunity to vote, and even that the stamp and the postage is paid for by the government so that the ballot will be delivered, and making sure those ballots can be cast up to and including election day. These are all the pieces that go into making sure that an election can function in the context of COVID. What I'm not speaking to, though, is campaigning in the context of COVID, which is a different issue altogether, um, and that, I think, poses a lot of questions. And Lala, when you have a chance, I'm interested in thinking about how elections and campaigning and participation will look uh, for volunteers and activists as well, because that's what your specialty is. Thanks. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that a bit. And um, before I do, I just want to um, underline how important it is to understand the differences between the different types of among the all the vote by mail um, uh, permutations that are out there. They're definitely not all made the same. And I think, Abdi, you spoke really clearly about how it is that um, we have to maintain some of this in-person voting um, in order that we don't create um, bigger problems than we're trying to solve here. Um, the equity issues are are real and challenging to deal with, but um, can be addressed by thoughtful, thoughtful policy. Um, and yes, the part that comes right before the voting is the campaigning. Um, and it is really, really challenging out there for state legislators in particular, all political candidates, but especially state legislators who are going to be, um, you know, helping to lead us out of this global pandemic um, come the fall because it's going to not be over anytime soon and there are going to be long-term ramifications. So these leaders that are trying to get elected or re-elected right now are facing incredible challenges and it's so hard and challenging to figure out how to raise money right now and how to um, use the right messaging um, and, uh, and their typical ways of getting to know voters um, and getting their name out there are not available. And so um, it makes other forms of contact uh, much more important, you know, because they can't go to all the community events and shake hands and meet people in person. They can't go knock on doors. Neither can their staff. It means that we're um, left with some more options like remote work, um, which is a lot of what my organization does. Um, and then, you know, as much as I would love to take money out of politics entirely, we're not there yet and still incredibly important. So, um, you know, there's 
COVID-19 has affected all aspects of the governance um, uh, life cycle and campaigning is one of them. This policy piece is another really important one. Um, the courts are another piece as well that we are also talking about. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you all see in terms of um, the policies as um, affected by COVID and what are some of the more promising trends, the things that you think are really good and what are some of the more worrisome trends um, uh, that if they gained more traction, it um, would have detrimental effects. Um, so Rick, why don't we start with you? Yeah, let me start by saying, uh, to go back to the point about the need for in-person voting, I want to add one more reason that I think is really compelling because, you know, some people might be more conservative and they're listening uh, to uh, Opti's point about uh, people who don't have um, access to housing and uh, maybe they're not going to get a ballot. Uh, let me bring it home to many voters in Wisconsin and in Ohio. Who, who live in their, they've lived in their home for many years, they requested an absentee ballot and the ballot never arrived in time. Those people were disenfranchised too. And they were disenfranchised even though you wouldn't expect them to be under the usual rules because COVID has upset all kinds of things. So one of the things that happened in Wisconsin was that they received five times the number of absentee ballot requests than they normally do, and it overwhelmed their system. Uh, and so some people didn't get to vote, and they had to go in person. Uh, and, and in Ohio, too, they had to go in person and cast a provisional ballot. Um, so there's lots of reasons, even if you're just thinking about the typical Republican voter, the older white um, voter in uh, rural Wisconsin, uh, faces a serious risk of disenfranchisement. So this is not something that is, you know, falls on one side of the ideological or political line. This is a real concern for everyone. Um, and I think that does, does dovetail into, you know, in terms of what worries me and what um, uh, gives me some hope. Uh, what worries me is that there's going to be, there are going to be big changes in how our elections look in November, assuming we're still in the throes of this virus uh, in the fall. And that means that election officials are going to be overwhelmed with absentee ballots. They're going to be overwhelmed. How are they going to find hand sanitizer? I mean, just think about kind of the nitty gritty. How are they going to find poll workers? Uh, poll workers who tend to be older, who are going to be willing to staff um, in, in Wisconsin, uh, in Milwaukee County, 175 out of 180 polling places were closed, not because um, they wanted to close them, uh, but because they had no workers to work in them. And so um, the real challenge is how do you ramp up? Uh, and how do you ensure that uh, even with the best of intentions that people are actually going to be able to cast their ballot? So the good news is, and what gives me hope is we're about six months away from the election. Uh, it's not like what was faced in Wisconsin, where they had only a number of weeks to try to ramp things up. We know what's coming. We're sounding the alarm now. You want to get absentee ballots printed? There was a, a recent story at NPR about the ballot printers already being um, inundated with uh, requests for printing. Now things have to be done. I saw a recent tweet by a political science professor at the University of Florida who said, you know, request your absentee ballot now. It's kind of another way of flattening the curve, right? So the idea is we should spread out our requests too, so we're more likely to get our ballots. So uh, there's a, it's a big challenge, but there's some time. Six months is going to be enough time if we put our minds to it now. That's why through political action and legislation and litigation, I think we can try to uh, assure that as many eligible voters as possible are able to cast a ballot in a way that's going to be safe for them and the ballot's going to be fairly and accurately counted. Well, could I point out it's understandable and, in fact, inevitable that we're going to be focused on the virus and the challenges that that presents. But Rick and I both wrote our books warning about election crises, a meltdown, as he calls it, uh, before the virus, before we even knew about it. And it's bizarre how quickly we've forgotten that the last presidential election, we had a foreign power hacking to try to affect the election. They did it, as far as we know, only through disseminating misinformation and uh, embarrassing emails. But we know that hackers have the capability and the desire to change votes from one candidate to another. What happens if they succeed in 2020? Uh, 
What happens if there's a terrorist attack or a, a weather event that destroys much of the infrastructure of our election machinery just before or on the day of the election? There are a lot of things that can go wrong with elections, and we're really not prepared for any of them, I'm afraid. Uh, so there is a lot we have to do between now and November uh, in case, uh, in, on account of the virus. But the other nightmare scenario we talked about a while ago was waking up and not knowing who won. And that may be for reasons having nothing to do with the virus. That happened in 2000 simply because there was a de facto tie. And if we haven't learned from what happened in 2000, if that were to happen on November 4th of this year, uh, we will wake up and everyone will look around and say, what do we do next? And we won't know whether it's the state legislatures or the federal legislatures or the state courts or the federal courts that should be resolving this. So one of the things I'd love to see done, I doubt it will be done between now and November, but we can dream, is the establishment of a nonpartisan commission given the responsibility and power to resolve an election crisis uh, with whatever remedies might be necessary. So I'll just throw that out there as something that I, I don't know it's on anyone's immediate wish list because the, the virus has uh, eclipsed everything else, but we do have to think about how we resolve crises, elections, even in normal times. Yeah, I, I would like to uh, echo those uh, ideas. And, and uh, you know, my book came out the day of the Iowa Democratic Caucus, which was uh, <laughs> an example of meltdown. It was pretty good timing. Um, although I just read about a, an author who's got a book on pandemics coming out, uh, a fictional book. So, you know, you never know what your timing is going to be. Uh, but uh, in our uh, report, Fair Elections in a Crisis, we proposed a bipartisan uh, election crisis commission that wouldn't have power uh, uh, other than the power of persuasion, but it would be out there to try to provide advice as to what goes beyond the pale. And I also just want to say that the kinds of things that worried me before coronavirus um, are exacerbated by the virus. So, for example, one of my concerns is campaign misinformation and voter suppression. We know, for example, that the Russians targeted African Americans, especially in 2016, with messages of um, don't vote, uh, Hillary Clinton doesn't care about you type messages, and to try to demobilize uh, African American voters. Uh, I'm concerned about misinformation and about uh, rhetoric related to the virus. For example, false information about uh, whether it's safe to go out in public, uh, false information about delays in elections. So even if the election can't be delayed, spreading a message that polling places are closed. And so there's going to be a lot of responsibility on the media and on social media companies to make sure that in this environment that we do not have suppression occurring through misinformation. And it's a really tough battle for the social media companies because they do want to protect free speech and they also, they're dealing with billions of postings and so just the volume is so high. But it's really their responsibility to make sure that they're not used again as they were in 2016 by a foreign power to try to manipulate the outcome of our elections. That's a really great um, uh, transition into another thing I wanted to ask you all about, which is, um, you know, Alan mentioned uh, the um, Russian foreign influence, all other kinds of potential uh, folks who are trying to interfere with our elections. What's being done about election security and, um, you know, how, how should we be evaluating um, the policies that, and the practices that are being put forth to respond? Well, I'll kick that off. I think one of the core elements is the importance of paper ballots. And that's critical for the in-person voting. And it's also one of the advantages of the absentee ballot. Having a paper trail throughout the process uh, provides a level of security in an election that um, an electronic system of voting certainly does not. So I would say, Lala, that's one component of election security is, is making sure that the vote is backed up by a paper trail. So in, in our report, go ahead. I, should say, I, I agree with that. And in terms of what's being done, as I understand it, Senator McConnell has made it very difficult to do much of anything. He has really resisted efforts at cybersecurity, which blows one's mind. And I just want to emphasize, almost everything all of us has been talking about should be bipartisan 
It really, the idea of expanding the franchise, of making voting safe, of reducing voter disinformation, but amazingly in the climate we're in, uh, it, it, we rarely hear Republicans joining the call that we're all making. So I guess I have a somewhat different view on this. I think that um, the federal government through the DHS has actually done a pretty good job so far this year, despite uh, the president and despite the failure uh, of a fully adequate funding to come out of the Senate. Uh, working with state and local governments, I've been talking to election administrators and they are getting help. And they're all um, aware now about phishing attempts and other ways of trying to get into voter registration databases. Um, uh, there's much more paper going, that's going to be used in 2020 compared to 2016. Those fully electronic systems are on their way out in most places. And, and our Fair Elections and Crisis Report says there should be a piece of paper that can be recounted, which is necessary for voter confidence. I'm worried, though, that we're fighting the last war. And so one of the nightmare scenarios I describe in Election Meltdown is, what about a cyber attack that takes down the power grid in Detroit on Election Day? And the point I made in the book is, you know, there's not much we can do as non-cybersecurity experts other than try to pressure our elected officials to make sure they're looking to stop that. But one of the things I wrote, and, and it's truer today in the era of COVID-19, is states need to have a plan B. So what happens if the power goes out? What happens if polling places are closed? What's the plan B? And this needs to be worked on now. And there are too few places, because this is, this is something that is in the control of election officials uh, and is in the control of, uh, of state elected officials. What's going to happen if we have a disaster, whether that's a hurricane, terrorist attack? Uh, because you know, now we're vulnerable with this virus uh, to all kinds of other uh, attempts to influence our elections. States need to have a plan B going forward, and that's the most important thing. If the, if the, and so one of the things we recommended in our report is suppose that the electronic poll books in a state go down, so you can't check people's voter registration uh, uh, information. There need to be hard copies of those available in polling places on election day. So there need to be redundancies, there need to be things done, and there are things that can be done. And if we, we list a specific number of things in our report, Fair Elections in a Crisis, that talk about how to assure that if something goes wrong, there's a backup. Excellent. I really appreciate all of that discussion. I think um, this is an area which Rick, as you said, is very ch challenging for us to do much about as ordinary citizens, but uh, it is really encouraging um, to hear that you've seen um, some good movement on that. So I just want to take us back um, to talk a little bit about the courts again. Um, and actually, if we could start by talking a little bit about the Supreme Court and where we, um, what we can expect from there. Um, Rick, you mentioned that we can't expect much out of federal policy. Um, what do we think about um, the Supreme Court and then also the other federal courts, courts of appeal and district courts and what role um, they are going to play? Um, Abdi, why don't you kick us off? Well, you know, there are nine justices and ACLU lawyers go to court and make our argument citing the Constitution of the United States, citing the precedents of the court, citing the statutes of Congress. And we make our argument before those nine justices. And sometimes we can persuade and sometimes we don't, but we take our best shot. And when we enter that courtroom, we have to respect the justices and make our arguments based on reason and not based on who was appointed by whom. And I think that the citizenship case, um, the, the citizenship question in the census case was a really interesting case that went up to the Supreme Court. And we were ultimately successful in having the Supreme Court essentially remove that question from the census or prohibit it from being on the census. And it came out because of the most unexpected way possible. Uh, a former consultant who had crafted and argued for that expressly for partisan purposes passes away. His daughter finds the records and it works its way up and through. Uh, were it not for that, would we have gotten the fifth vote? Hard to know. 
And uh, many people think we wouldn't have based on the way the decisions were, were written at the end of the day. So I will say that we make our best case before whatever judge we draw in a district court, an appeals court, or a Supreme Court. And that's the role of an ACLU lawyer is to represent the client and make the best argument. There's also state courts. State courts get far less attention, uh, but they're fundamentally important. And in the area of partisan gerrymandering, for example, the Supreme Court has said that basically they're not going to get involved in the issue of partisan gerrymandering. But even so, we and uh, many of our partners have succeeded in state courts uh, to strike down the extreme partisan gerrymandering of maps. So that's what we do. Um, that's the job of an ACLU lawyer or any civil rights lawyer is to go before the judge, make your case, and argue for a client. Thanks for highlighting the state court angle. I was going to, that's going to be my next question. So um, Alan or Rick, either of you, I'd love to hear um, any insights on, um, you know, what else we can expect, what, what to look for as we look to the courts at any level. But one thing I'd say is that if you're, um, if it comes down to who's going to win the election, Trump or Biden, and the U.S. Supreme Court has to decide that, I'm, I'm not confident that we can think of the Supreme Court as a nonpartisan institution. I want to remind you that during Bush versus Gore, when the court divided five to four, two of the justices in the dissent were Republican appointed justices, David Souter and John Paul Stevens. Now we're in this unusual situation where well, I don't want to say unusual, but we're in a different situation where all of the conservatives on the court were appointed by a uh, Republican president and all the liberals on the court were appointed by a Democratic president. And it's become increasingly common to talk about the Republican majority on the Supreme Court and the Democratic uh, minority. And so I worry if it comes down to that, um, uh, that's bad for the court and it's bad for American democracy. But I do think on these questions in the lead up to the election. We are seeing both state and federal courts at the lower level take seriously the fact that coronavirus has changed the calculus and that changes need to be made and laws need to be interpreted in order to enfranchise voters. And so that does give me some hope. Um, I can't say I'm optimistic about things, but I will say that I am, uh, uh, I, I am pleased that so far the courts have taken seriously arguments that have enfranchised voters. And so, um, uh, I think keep making your arguments and, uh, and, and hope for the best. And uh, of course, uh, I, I can't let any time when I'm talking about uh, my uh, book collection meltdown uh, go by without mentioning the election administrator's prayer, uh, which is, Lord, let this election not be close. Uh, because when it's close, you see all the ugly parts and uh, there's room for all kinds of manipulation of things. Uh, if, if it's not close, then less likely we're going to have problems. Lala, I want to just say twice uh, in this talk, I've heard uh, Professor Hazen say, um, I'm not optimistic, but I am at least hopeful. And I think that that could be your, your uh, t-shirt or your mantra. <laughs> I love it. I, I think in terms of God help us when elections are close, this gets back to the Electoral College, and it tends to produce squeaker elections. And I think historically, if you look at the 2000 election, if that had been resolved by a national popular vote, the candidates were separated by 500,000 votes. And it was only because of the Electoral College that you had a virtual tie and a state that happened to be governed by one of the candidates' brothers. And we know all the, all the other things that had to align for it to be just as bad as it was. But 2000 is historically the rule, not the example, in that the Electoral College produces much closer elections by and large than a national popular vote will. So at, at the risk of just mounting my hobby horse uh, one too many times, I do think uh, we should not ignore the Electoral College. That's not going to be changed before November. And we are, right now, the virus is our focus. But I think if we're looking big picture, long term, that's probably the single most important thing we can do uh, to improve our presidential election process is to abolish the Electoral College. There's a lot to think about there, for sure. And um, before um, I ask my last two questions, um, I just wanted to highlight the importance of state courts again and let everybody know, for those, I mean, you all on this 
the, the entire panel knows, but our audience may not realize that in many states, judges, state judges are also elected. Um, and I, you know, I think that there's pros and cons to that, but in terms of thinking about them as partisan or nonpartisan, um, that's a really important um, consideration um, of what happens um, and how these judges make their decisions. Um, great, so I wanna close with a couple questions. Um, the first question I have for you is uh, what state are you watching most closely this year and why? Um, I'm happy to kick us off, actually. I am watching Texas very closely. Um, we saw some exciting um, activism in Texas last year. Um, they defeated SB9, which would have made it harder for people with disabilities and the elderly to vote, threatened voters with jail time and enormous fines for innocent mistakes, um, and would have shifted polling locations away from communities of color. Um, but uh, a really well-networked group of activists and advocates there were able to defeat this bill in the state legislature. Um, and what I'm so excited about for Texas this year is that we've got an opportunity to go on offense. Um, we only need nine seats to flip the state house in Texas. Um, there are coincidentally nine seats that were are currently held by a Republican where Beto won in 2018, so it's entirely entirely possible in a field of a, you know, there's 150 seats in that chamber. Um, and we can really go on offense and really expand voting rights in a very powerful way, not to mention the other um, impacts it can have on progressive policy, gerrymandering, um, and um, undoing a lot of the gerrymandering um, and expanding uh, the electorate for Texans, um, which will have, which could have nationwide effects. So my organization, Sister District, is supporting voters in Texas this year, um, uh, races there, as well as in eight other states. Um, and that Texas is, is one of my favorites, especially since a lot of people don't think of it as a battleground quite yet. So um, uh, let's see, Alan, why don't we start with you? So I'm, I'm going to partially punt and say I'm looking at all the swing states and take that as an opportunity to say, once again, the Electoral College, only six or seven or eight states even matter. You know, there are 40 states where we can tell you right now exactly who's going to win. Um, and, and so that's a real problem. And uh, that's it. I'm, I'm looking at all the swing states, the obvious candidates, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Florida, etc. Abdi, how about you? You know, thankfully, there's an ACLU director in every state. And so what I have to focus on personally is the right to vote in California. And in particular, what I'll be watching for is we've succeeded in the last few years to pass really sweeping uh, election reforms in our state. Automatic voter registration, uh, election day registration. We already have universal access and our secretary of state, our legislature and governor are working and we're an advocacy group, we're pushing to ensure access. So I wanna just see like, how does California measure up? And even though we're not a state where you think of it as having active voter suppression, and it's not a partisan, uh, it's not a swing state, uh, California actually has fallen short on election and voter participation. So I'm excited to see how well we can bolster that through the state policy reforms um, that we're advocating for. Rick, how about you? What state are you watching? So I'd be tempted to say North Carolina or Wisconsin. Those are kind of the usual suspects. So I'll go a little out of the box and say Georgia. Uh, Georgia is very interesting. Uh, as I described in election meltdown, there was a very contested race for governor between uh, Brian Kemp, who was the um, existing secretary of state, who was both running in and running the election, uh, and Stacey Abrams, uh, who narrowly lost. And then uh, put her energy behind uh, a voting rights group called Fair Fight uh, Action. And uh, now Kemp is the governor. Uh, and um, there are kind of two impulses in the state. You know, one is to make sure that people can vote in the uh, era of coronavirus. And the other is to engage in acts of voter suppression like voter purges. Uh, and uh, while the state expanded vote by mail uh, because of the coronavirus, they also announced a voter fraud task force, which could be seen as intimidating voters. And so um, 
now that you know there's an active group, I wish there were a group like uh, Fair Fight in all the states, but people are going to be watching. And you know, one of my nightmare scenarios, you know, I talk about, you know, and everybody talks about, what if Trump won't concede? Uh, my concern is, uh, what if uh, Trump narrowly wins Georgia or Florida? But Democrats believe it was because of voter suppression, and so I don't want that to happen. And so I want to make sure that there's a fair election taking place in places like Florida. We didn't even talk about felon disenfranchisement and the. The, the, the lawsuit that's going on in Florida, but th that's another really huge issue. Uh, you know, we could probably have ten more conversations about what's going on state by state uh, on on these issues. It's a, it's a, as I said earlier, it's a state by state slog to protect voting rights in the United States. It certainly is. Um, so I want to close us out with uh, kind of a revisited version of the first question, which is what a dream scenario might look like in November 2020. Um, and uh, what is the most important thing or what's, what are the most important types of things that need to happen to get us there? Why don't we go, on, go ahead. I'll take that first and say, you know, Rick said it's the, God help us, the close election, I'd say first and foremost, it would be really nice if there is a decisive winner. Uh, and if that person wins in both the popular vote and the electoral college, we don't have a split as we have in two of the last five elections. Um, and I don't think it's a secret uh, which candidate I'd like to see win. But if you told me right now that there's a fair election, everyone can trust the results, and it's reasonably decisive, I'd take it. Abby? I think it comes down to uh, where we started when Rick talked about the vision that the Constitution should affirmatively say that every person has a right to vote. Uh, my dream scenario would be that going into this November's election, through the hard work of activists and grassroots groups and election administrators and policymakers and lawyers who had to go to court and judges who made the right decision, that every American citizen including and especially those who have been most at the margin, have a meaningful, safe way to cast their ballot in America's democracy. Rick? I, I couldn't have said it better. That's exactly what I would have said. Uh, all eligible voters have uh, the ability to cast a ballot that meaningfully counts. I think that's really, it, it's kind of the, the very basic definition of a democracy, but it's something we are struggling with. Uh, and we were struggling with before the virus and we're struggling with it even more now. And so I, uh, I'll go back to hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful that we will see a, uh, an election where we don't hear after the fact about people waiting in line for seven hours and risking their uh, health and safety uh, or about people whose ballots never arrived and they were disenfranchised. Yeah. Wonderful. And I actually have one last question, which is what advice would you give to listeners and watchers who would like to do something about this, who want to get involved? Um, I think the first thing I would recommend that they do is to purchase your books and to read them, to educate themselves. Um, and then what, what else? Why don't we go in backwards order, Rick? So uh, I get this question a lot. What can I do as the average person? I think the answer is because we have such a hyper-polarized election system, that means that you can be in touch with your local election officials. Right? So I live in Los Angeles County. I just saw a story about how they're not going to have in-person voting centers for a special election for to replace Katie Hill in Congress. They're not going to have a voting center in Lancaster, which has a large African-American population. And so I plan to bring that up with the LA County Registrar and say, why is that? Um, you can ask, well, what are you doing about transparency? Am I going to know what the vote totals are on election night? How many ballots are left to be counted? Can I observe this? What are your, what's your plan B if there's a power outage? Ask the questions. And because they're local, you're, you're more likely to get an answer. Absolutely. These folks are, um, you know, it's not some magical set of officials sitting in a fancy room somewhere. These are, as you said, exactly right. They're local officials. They're able to listen to you and um, the, the impact that citizens can have um, and anybody who lives in the community can be really outsized. So wonderful. Abdi? I would pick up on what Rick said and just be real specific to uh, the viewers in California and especially the Bay Area, which is the natural kind of first audience of the festival. And our county administrators have a lot of say. Uh, 
in uh, uh, Alameda County, Contra Costa County? Where do they locate the polling places? Uh, what precautions will they take at those polling places? Uh, what early voting will be provided, et cetera? And so with all of that said, I think the picking up the phone and calling the county administrator and then tracking your state legislation. Every state is going to have bills that are going to try to do right by voting. And there may well be bills that will try to suppress voting. And so pick up the phone, call that lawmaker uh, and get involved. So I was also going to say that, but I would say don't neglect the, your member of Congress. Um, Senators Klobuchar and Wyden have introduced legislation which would uh, assist states in developing a robust vote-by-mail system. Um, that's very important. And the other thing I would say to everyone is vote. I completely agree, and I want to round us out by also saying, especially to California folks, but wherever you are in the country, um, to work on this long term, it requires good state legislators who are champions of um, voting rights, and um, we to, to get good folks elected into these state legislative positions. Um, you can check out Sister District, even if you don't live in a battleground state, um, you can get involved from wherever you are and um, help to elect great folks that way. So um, I think that we are getting close to time. So I wanna just say thank you again to Alan Hirsch, Rick Hassan, Abdi Sultani for joining us. Um, it's been wonderful to have this conversation with you. Um, a true honor. I feel very privileged to have the opportunity to moderate this panel and to have this discussion. Um, so closing us out at the end of this video, there's going to be a link um, and you can by election meltdown and a short history of presidential election crises um, there and have them shipped directly to you so you don't have to leave your house during this time. Um, so thank you again. My name is Lala Wu and really glad that you were able to join us for the Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Mm -hmm.